as I get myself squared away here. I have to tell you, this has been an interesting week for me. The pastor's away, <clears throat> and uh, I was working on my message, and I changed what I wanted to do. Maybe I shouldn't say I changed, but I was impressed to change and do something else. I'm saying the Spirit impressed me to do something else, and so this is what I have. But there was one thing that really uh, challenged me. I'll put it that way. It really challenged me was, with this message, I wanted to have some slides. And so with the pastor being away, I did not have slides uh, prepared that I could ask him to put into the presentation. So it was something that I needed to do. And so I, I text him real quick to try and find out what do you need to do to put slides into your presentation. And so he told me what to do. And it sounds very simple. Well, you get your picture, you click on this, and you move it there, and then you go to the other computer that you want to put them on, and the program, and you open that up, you click on the picture, and you just slide it over there. All right, sounds easy. It sounds real simple. Unfortunately, um, I'm not very good at that. Uh, <laughs> I'm not very good at computers, as a matter of fact. You know, I'm still learning a lot. And as Christians, that's something we should always be doing, is always learning. And so I come to the church here. I got my laptop, and I got the stuff on here. And I'm trying to transfer from my computer, from my laptop to the laptop here. And it's just not working. And so the first day, I just went home because I was frustrated. And uh, I came back again. After I got home and worked out a few things, I came back again and I tried it. And things started to slowly work. So the first picture I was able to get from here to there, and then I got ready. I was feeling encouraged. And so I got ready to do the second one. And then it was all of a sudden, it's like, what did I do? I couldn't remember exactly the steps that I had taken. So I kind of had to start all over again, pushing buttons and searching for things to tell me what to do. And so I got it again and again and again. So finally, I ended up getting the slides together on the presentation that I have here. And I'm going to talk about the Lord's house. The title is Going Up to the Lord's House. Now, I will say this here, not apologizing for the slides, but I just want to let you know the slides are not the best of slides, okay? This is my first attempt, and quite frankly, I'm proud of what I did, even though it isn't the best of things that could have happened. But you know how it is when you're learning something, you have to start baby steps. So these here are not the best, but by the time I give another message, if I have slides, they should be better. So, thank you, yes. That's the way it is with, with uh, Christians. You know, we, we try and we always try to move up. We always try to upgrade. So, today's message, going up to the Lord's house. And uh, I just want to share a few things with you. Uh, I was impressed by this here because quite often we hear stories in the Bible about certain incidents. And sometimes we wonder, where did that happen? And so I have a few incidents, a few uh, happenings that I want to mention here today with my presentation. And so as I prepare to do that, I just want to say a word of prayer, and then I'll get into the message itself, going up to the Lord's house. So let us pray. Father, we're thankful for your blessings. I thank you, Lord, for allowing me to be here, and I ask, Father, that your spirit will guide me and that there will be a blessing had for each and every one of us today. We ask, Father, that your angels will be with us, that they will protect us and, and just keep back the forces of the enemy, Lord. And when all is said and done, as long as we love you, love our fellow man, and we serve you, Lord, things will be well between us. So thank you for being here. Thank you for this message. Bless your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Going up to the Lord's house. <clears throat> All right, so this is something new for me here. All right. And I'm going to start off with the uh, words from Psalms 122. Psalms 122, it says, 
I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. The temple in Jerusalem, that temple is called the house of God or the Lord's house, and there are other names that it can be called. And people are invited to go to the Lord's house to meet him there and form a personal relationship with him. And it's pretty much like the situation when God came down on the mountain and he called the people to come to the, to the mountain, but the people did not come. But God wanted to establish a personal relationship with them, just like he had established with Moses. And so we end up with a tabernacle. We end up with a, um, a temple. Now, there was one thing about that. When the children of Israel, when they left Egypt, they were in bondage. And when they left Egypt, there was a mixed multitude with them. It wasn't just the children of Israel, Israel but there was a mixed multitude. And along with that mixed multitude, we find that there were those who were obedient and those who were not. Even with the children of Israel, we find that there were those who were obedient and those who were not. And so when they left, God did not make a separation between them. I want to start with that as, as we move forward here. God did not make a distinction between uh, the two uh, groups of people, if you will. When it came time to protect them from Pharaoh, you know, they left Egypt. Pharaoh said, okay, this is not good. Pharaoh went to capture them again. So God protected the Israelites and the mixed multitude. He protected all of them. When it came time out in the wilderness that they needed some water, God gave water to both groups. He did not make any distinction. The uh, Israelites and the mixed multitude got water. When it was time to feed them with manna, he gave manna to both groups. God is not making any distinction between them. As a matter of fact, he told them that if a uh, stranger should sojourn with you, you are to treat, and if that stranger obeys my laws and keeps my commandments and my ordinances, etc., he said, there was to be no difference made between you and the stranger. And so that's the way it should have been, but we know that things changed. All right, now, as I get into the message, I'm going to go to slide, my first slide. Okay. There we go. <laughs> All right. Now, this one is a little off, but anyway, the thing is, the, the part that I want you to see is, like, this is the temple complex. This is what God's people had built for him. Well, not. Yeah, I'll say this is actually Herod's temple. So this is the temple that Jesus knew. And there are places here that I just want to point out, and I have other slides as we move along here. At the, uh, and, I, and yours would be, okay, same thing. You see the red, that long red uh, house there, or housing or building? Okay, there, there was a portico, and uh, the Sanhedrin, I believe, had a place there that they would meet, and there were other courts all around the place, and the first court we're gonna talk about in a few minutes is the court of the Gentiles. Now, on this here slide, you'll see that uh, not only do you have Sanhedrin, but you got various courts, and I'm gonna have a little better picture of the various courts coming up. But then you have the temple there also. All right, now, um, the, this house was built, this temple was built on Mount Moriah. And so in order to get to the temple, you had to go up to the mountain. You had to go up the mountain to the temple. And so there were many gates. Now I was reading and there was a discrepancy. And I, I know that as you look, as you study, you'll find that there are things that are not that they're not positive about because the temple has been totally destroyed. And so there's a lot of things that we're not sure about, but I'm gonna give you some information. And if you read, you might find something a little different and that's okay because there are some things that they're not sure about and I'll mention a couple of those as I go along. But they said that there were 12 gates that led to this temple. Somebody else said that there was 10. And so you see you got a little discrepancy going on there. But my bringing that up is 
for the purpose of letting you know that there is a temple in heaven. There's a place in heaven called the New Jerusalem. All right, so in the New Jerusalem, there's a temple there. And it says that that temple has 12 gates, three on each side. This is four sides of square, so three on each side. So that temple in heaven, that place has four gates and three uh, gates on each side. So a lot that is shown or happens in the temple on the earth here can be linked to the sanctuary and the temple in heaven. And I found that out as I was studying. Now I'm going to move on to the next slide here. Okay, here we go. Now with this slide, it shows some of the courts and other places. There were several different courts. Once you went up to the mount and you went inside, there's always stairs, there's always stairs. So remember that there's always stairs. So stairs, you would go up to the main platform, and the main platform was huge. And that platform was called the Court of the Gentiles. The Court of the Gentiles, I would like you to remember that. On the slide there, you see on the top and on the bottom, it says Court of the Gentiles. There's a small area on the slide, but in reality, the Court of the Gentiles was much larger than this here slide uh, is able to show. But from there, on the slide, you'll see that there's a place that is circled in red. It says Court of the Women, and then there's the Court of the Priests. So there are different courts. There are different sections to the temple, and, uh, and each one has its own specific purpose. So I'm going to, not ready for the next slide yet. All right, a little information about this here. You first went up to the first level, which was the court of the Gentiles. That's the base level. And then you would go up some stairs about eight feet higher than the court of the Gentiles. And that would lead you into the court of the women. And then there were more stairs that were about 10 feet higher than that court. And that would lead you into the court of the Israelites, or the men's court. And then there were more stairs. You go up those stairs about three feet higher. And then that would lead you into the court of the priest. And I was told, and I didn't have time to really check this out, but I believe there were some stairs from there that led up to the sanctuary itself. And I'm pretty sure that that is true, and I, I didn't take time to look that up. But uh, there are stairs that lead higher and higher and higher from each and every platform. Now, the thought there is that the higher you go, the more holy you are. See, see the thinking of man? So you start on the bottom, the court of the Gentiles. They're Gentiles. They're not all holy. They're not set. And then you go to the court of the women. Well, the women are a little more holy than the Gentiles, than Israelite women, I should say. And then you go to the court of the men. Men are a little holier than women. And then you go to the court of the priests. Each level, holier and holier, and then you get to the sanctuary itself. Now, we know that that is not true. We know today that that is not true. And if you have any issues with that, please take them up with God and his word, not me. <laughs> okay? I'm going to step out of this here. But there were several different courts, and they were used for different reasons or different purposes, I should say. Now, oops, went on there. Now, I'm going to share a little information about each court and some things that happen in each court, which uh, are, I think, Bible stories that we're familiar with. Now, first with the court of the Gentiles, and that's a large area. Like I said, it's not shown on that slide, but the court of the Gentiles, <clears throat> it was surrounded. The court of the Gentiles basically surrounded all of the other courts. So it was the court of the Gentiles, and in there you had the court of the women, the court of the men, the court of the... All things were surrounded by the court of the Gentiles. And uh, this was the only court, this was the only place that non-Jews could go into that sanctuary, into that temple. They could go there, and they could uh, exchange their money for temple money and you know, give their offerings and so forth, but that was the only place that they could go in the temple. And there's an incident that happened 
in that court. And I think many of us know about Jesus and the money changers. Well, there was a time when Christ and his disciples came into the temple and he saw that the money changers were in there changing and selling and buying, and he turned over the tables and chased some of them out. You know, to me, when I first heard that story, I thought they were just taking over all of the area of the Gentiles. But I did a little more reading and I found out that what happened was in the temple, there were places for just about everything that was needed for the Sanhedrin to meet. There were shops. There were places to go to worship. There were places to go if you wanted something to eat. So it was like a huge mall like we have today, a huge mall where there are so many activities going on. But the thing that Christ didn't like is those who were selling and exchanging, etc., they had a certain area that they were supposed to be in. And what happened was this was a big holiday coming up, and they wanted to sell more. They wanted to do more. And so they expanded out. They went beyond their space. They went where they should not have been. And so that is the reason why Jesus came, saw that they had encroached upon the place, uh, the court of the Gentiles, and they had moved further in than they should have. And that is where he got angry, and he chased them out, letting them know that his father's house, they had desecrated his father's house, it should be a house of prayer. But they had made it, he said, a den of thieves. Now, granted, not all of them were a part of that den of thieves, but there were those who uh, were more interested in making money than, than they were in um, helping those who were not um, not Jewish, helping them to understand their, the Messiah, the, the hope that they have. And so Jesus was a little bit angry about that. Now, that court is also more than likely the court that Jesus was in when at 12 years old he got left behind by his parents. I'll explain that in just a second. The reason why I say that is in the court of the Gentiles, it was possible for Gentiles to come, and not only that, but anyone could come to the court of the Gentiles. Jew, non-Jew, anyone could come there. And the priests and the rabbis loved going out into that court, and they spent time teaching and uh, pre I should, yeah, I'm going to say teaching and preaching out in the, in, the, in the Gentile court. So if there was a stranger that had questions about the temple, about their God or anything like that, they would meet them if they were a Gentile, they would meet them out there in the court of the Gentiles and they would speak to them. They would explain things to them. And uh, that was one way that the gospel could be spread or the message of their God could be spread. And uh, there, were, there were many who came there. And uh, this, once again, as I said, I believe that is the place where Jesus was at, when at the age of 12, his mother and father went to the feast of the Passover, and they went with a crowd. They went with family, and it was, a hard, it was a huge crowd. And the thing is, when you get around family, I don't know how many of you have family, but I'm from a large family, 10 children, and then you got all brothers and sisters and nephews and nieces. But sometimes you have a family event, and everybody kind of watches everyone's children. No one is supposed to be left alone. No child is supposed to be left alone. Someone should be watching them. And that was the case here. The family and friends had come to Jerusalem to uh, worship at the Passover. And then when it came time to leave, they left. Mary and Joseph left with their family. And they were thinking that Jesus was somewhere in that group of people that left. And after they traveled for a day, they looked around, couldn't find him, and then they went back to the temple, and it says about three days' time, that's when they found Christ. That's when they found Jesus in the temple, and it says that, um, let me see. It says that he was sitting in their, in their midst, in the midst of the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And those who were there were astonished at his understanding and his answers. And so Christ astonished them with his 12-year-old questions and answers. He showed a, 
a great knowledge for the word of God. And this here incident is recorded in Luke, the second chapter, verses 41 through 52. All right. All right. Now, as we move from the court of the Gentiles and the court of the women, we see steps, and that's on our slide there. And I have another one here, which I'm going to show. Okay. Now, <clears throat> in the left corner, at the bottom, there is a gate there. You go through that gate and you end up on that plaza that you see, and that is the court of the women. <clears throat> now, if you look at that picture, you'll see in the court of the women, there are four large candelabras, four large lampstands, if you will. And I'm going to talk about those lampstands in a little bit. Quite interesting. God's house is supposed to be a house of prayer, the court of the women. Now, at the court of the women, Jewish women, Israelites could come there. Women and men could congregate in that court. And there was a balcony also there where they could go up and stand and look over into, well, the, the next court, the court of the men. Now, <clears throat> a few things that I found interesting about that. In this court, the court of the women, okay, let's get this right here. All right. In the court of the women, there were boxes there for money to, to put your offering into. And as you move in, I think I got another picture here of that. Okay, that's the court of the women. And within the court of the women, there were about 11 places where you could go and place your money or give your offering. And uh, Jesus and his disciples were there at one time. And that's when there was a widow. All right, that's when a widow came and she gave the widow's might. You hear the story about the widow's might. That's in Mark, the 12th chapter, verses 41 through 44, or Luke, the 21st chapter, verses 1 through 4. Now, the thing is, what she gave, she gave willingly. And it was just a small amount. But the thing is about that is that she gave, she, she sacrificially gave. She did not have a lot of money. Like there were some who would come and they would place their money in there and it said that they liked to go and they liked to drop their money slowly so the people would hear them dropping their money into these here boxes. And uh, that, that gave them status in, in their mind. It gave them status to, because they're there and people are looking at them and watching them and hearing them drop all of this money into the box, the offering box. It is said, I don't know how true it is, but it was said that you could get an estimate of how much money they dropped in there if you listened to what was being dropped. You know how a penny makes a different sound than a nickel or a dime or something like that? You know, the different metals make different sounds, and so you could tell what they're dropping in there according to the sound that it made when it dropped into the box. Whether that's true or not, I don't know but there are some interesting stories that you hear as you go along. So <clears throat> that's where the widow was. She went in and she gave the widow's might. She gave sacrificially. She didn't have money to give, like some have what we call pocket change. Now I know today many may not know about pocket change because today we do so, much, so many transactions with our credit cards and debit cards and things like that, but for me, Pocket change has always been a part of my life, my dad and et cetera, and, and even me. You know, you go to the store and you pay, with some, pay for something with money, with your dollar bills and your five or whatever, and you get back change, put it in your pocket, you get home. What do I do with my pocket change? I put it in a drawer at home. So my pocket change, the little stuff that's left over, is accumulating in a drawer at home. At some point, I'll use it. 
So she did not give pocket change like some would give pocket change. Or, you know, they have so much money that they, they get interest on their money and they give from the interest. It is not hurting them. They're not losing anything by doing that. But the widow, when she gave, she gave sacrificially because she did not have it to give as others did. So that's the court of the women. That's where she would have given her widow's might. Now, in the court of the women, there were various rooms there. There were about four different chambers there, and I'll speak to those chambers in just a minute. Uh, and I have it written down here, the four different chambers. What each one was used for, let me see. All right. All right, here it is. <clears throat> There, on the four corners, there were four different chambers, and they were used for different purposes. All right, uh, first one, there was one there for the chamber of the Nazarites. There's another one, chamber of oils. Another one, it was the leper's chamber, chamber. And then there was another one, the chamber of wood. I found this to be a little interesting, the chamber of wood. If you wanted to, you could donate wood to the temple because of all the sacrifices and all the burnt offerings that they do. So you could donate wood to the temple for that offering purpose. <clears throat> but, and I found this here to be interesting and once again, the wood that they would give, it was inspected by a priest, by a Levite. And if the wood that they give, if, if it had worms or if it had bugs in it or anything like that, that wood was rejected. And I was thinking to myself, man, God is very particular. You know, he's very specific about certain things. And it's just like the lambs, the lambs that were bought to be uh, sacrificed and other animals that were to be sacrificed, they were supposed to be without spot or blemish. And if you bought in one with a spot or a blemish or a broken leg or anything like that, then it was rejected. And so our God is a God of order, and he's very particular about his people and the things that we do and how we serve him. And we need to uh, learn the way that he would have us serve him. So those were the four chambers there. And I'm going to... Okay, here it is. I'm going to get to those tech camera, the candlesticks. I messed up the word. But I'm going to get to those four candelabras that were in the court of the women. I don't know how often those candelabras were lit, but I do know that there was a feast called the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. And each year they were lit at that time. The Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of the Feast of Booths was a time of the year when the atonement had been made, the people had been cleansed, the temple had been cleansed, and after atonement, then the people had harvested their, um, their fruits and vegetables and so forth, and after that harvest, by that time, it was time to have the Feast of Booths, the Feast of uh, Tabernacles, it was, a, it was a time when people would go and take palm leaves and so, and so forth and build, actually, let me go back a little bit. They would build a structure outside. Some would build a little structure on the top of their roof. And they would enclose it three sides and on the top with palm branches and things of that nature. And they would live in those booths for seven days. The Feast of Booths was a seven-day feast. And each day at nighttime, these candelabras, these lampstands, if you will, they were lit. How you do that? I got different information here about the height of them. Someone said that they are about 65 feet high. Someone else said about 70, and someone else said about 85 feet high. And so once again, as you study, you will find discrepancies because the temple is no longer there and there's a lot of misinformation. But the thing is, they were very high. And what you would do is some of the young guys, they had the young Levites 
climb those things. I saw a picture where there were like, um, like a ladder on the side of it, like these high telephone poles and things. You know, you, it's very high, and you got a ladder that you climb up. And so I saw a picture of that. So I'm thinking that's how they got to the top of it. And they would pour oil into those four different bowls at the top. And once they poured the oil in there, then they were able to light it. And I also found out that they used, I, um, they used like a floating wick. When these priests and Levites, when their clothes started to wear out, they would rip their clothes into strips and they would use those strips as a wick for those lamps, for those floating, uh, floating lamps there for the light. So they would put those, they would fill those with oil, and at nighttime, they would be lit. And the thing is, it was said that those were so bright that all of Jerusalem was lit up at night. And when I looked at that, I said, that reminds me of something. Here is Jerusalem on the earth, but let's go to Jerusalem in heaven there. The holy city, New Jerusalem. In Revelation, we find this here. Revelation, the 21st chapter, verses 23. It says, the glory of the Lord that gives light to the new Jerusalem. It talks about God giving light to the new Jerusalem. There's no need for light. There's no need for candle in the new Jerusalem because God is the light thereof. And so just like the new Jerusalem on the earth here, there was light. There was, it was as if there was never any nighttime in new Jerusalem because during the day, you didn't need the lamps. And at nighttime, they lit the lamps, and there was light for everyone. And so it was daytime for seven days in the temple in Jerusalem. Revelation 22nd chapter, verse 5 says about the holy city, New Jerusalem. It says, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Amen. So once again, there are things that are happening in the old temple here that relate to the temple in heaven. All right, so we got the court of the women. Now, another thing with the court of the women, before we move on, because if you go and you look at the right-hand side of the slide, you get ready to move into the court of the Israelites or the court of the men. But there are some half-circle stairs in front of them. Well, okay, that shows well enough. On those stairs, there were Levites, and Levites would go to those stairs, and they would play music, and they would sing songs. So there was always some music going on in the court of the women. And uh, I thought that was very interesting also. Now, we're going to move on here. All right. There we go. That door there leads into the court of the men. And so you leave. Let me see. Yeah. Yes, you leave the court of the women, you go through those stairs, you go through those doors, and you enter into the court of the men. The court of the men was not a very large area, but the men of Israel, those pious men, it said that, that the pious ones, and not just pious ones, but those who came to worship God, and there were true worshipers also. And they would go through those doors, and there was a section where they could stand, and... Uh, as they stood there, they could pray, they could worship God there, and not only that, but a little bit higher than that was the court of the priest, and there were priests who were there for the specific purpose of coming to the wall, coming to them, and granting them a blessing. They would come, they would lay their hands on them, they would pray over them, and so they went there for a blessing. And that's the court of the men, and I don't have a good slide of that one. But we're going to move on with our slides here. Okay. All right. So we're getting ready to go to the court of the priest. Okay. All right. Court of the priest. All right. 
Now, the court of the priest, I was hoping that I would have been able to get a nice picture of that, but this is not the court of the priest. This here, this is actually the doors to the uh, sanctuary, but I'm going to get to that in a few minutes. That is uh, just a little bit higher than the court of the priest. But um, on the court of the priest, that's where you would go and uh, you had your uh, altar of burnt offering. That's where there was the labor for washing. Not only that, but there was an area there where they had the animals that were to be sacrificed and uh, they had all the instruments that they needed to sacrifice the animals and to divide their parts up and et cetera. And so that was the court of the priest. And uh, in the court of the priest, um, there was something. All right, I'm going to skip a little bit here because I, I want to get to something a little bit different. All right, the court of the priest, I'm going to move a little bit beyond that because of the sacrifice and everything that goes on there. But we want to move into the temple itself. The temple, as we know, the temple itself made, was made up of two parts. And in this temple here, when it was built by Herod, there were rooms around it. There were storage rooms. There was a place where the priest could go and eat. There was a place for, where the priest could go and sleep. And so it wasn't just the sanctuary itself, but along the sanctuary, there were other rooms uh, that could be utilized by priests and others. Now, in the sanctuary, when you go into the sanctuary, and this is not a good picture of it, but I'm going to mention these doors first. The doors here. In, in the uh, temple that Herod built, there was... I'm getting a little... I think I may change it. Okay, getting a little raspiness here. Okay, hold on, hold on. Okay, I'm going to change a little bit here. Since I'm having a little trouble, I can hear it starting to make a little sound that I don't like. And I know at one point it happened, and it was annoying, so I'm just going to turn this off. In the temple, as you go into the temple, there was... Okay, here we go. In the temple, on one side, there was the lampstand, and on the other side you had your table of showbread, and just before the most holy place, and you see the angels in the back there, or you see the wings of the angels in back, that, that is the most holy place. And uh, this is not, I would say, this is not a good representation simply because in the most holy place there was a curtain that divided the holy from the most holy place, and the curtain isn't there. There looks like there's a rod across the top there that indicates that there's the possibility of a curtain being hung there, but there's nothing there. So, all right. So there was a curtain that hung that divided the holy place where the candlestick the table of showbread and the altar of incense was, it divided those two. The temple or the uh, most holy place was where the Ark of the Covenant was. And that's the only furniture that was in the Ark of the Covenant, was the, in the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant. Now the curtain, I wanna talk a little bit about the curtain. It is said that that curtain was about three and a half inches to four inches thick and it was so strong, so thick that it says that a team of horses could not pull it apart. Now, with that thought in mind, keep that thought in mind that a team of horses could not pull that curtain apart because we're going to have to deal with that in a few minutes. Now, the curtain itself was embroidered with cherubims, angels, and not only was it embroidered with cherubims, but it was made of very, uh, various colors. It was made of blue, scarlet, and purple. You know, and, and it was quite, quite beautiful. And there is a story that goes along with that curtain. 
And I read it a few different places where it says that it was believed that the curtain in the temple was the hem of God's garment. There was a belief that, I don't know exactly when it got started, but they believed that the curtain in the temple was the hem of God's garment. And there's something in Isaiah. This is, gives a little proof to that. Isaiah, the sixth chapter, verses one. This is what Isaiah says. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting up on a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So Isaiah is saying that he saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of the Lord, and that word train is the bottom part or a hem of his garment. So in other words, Isaiah is saying, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the hem of his garment filled the temple. And so, like I said, I don't know where they got that from, that the hem of God's garment was the curtain in the temple, but I found that to be interesting. And I will speak to that in a few moments, why I think it is so interesting. Now, <clears throat> in order to get to the part about the curtain and why I find it to be so interesting, we have to go to uh, the crucifixion of Christ. Remember the, remember the curtain, remember the curtain. I'm going to skip a lot of information I didn't write it down anyway, but if you know the story, you know about Christ, uh, how he was falsely accused, and he ended up being crucified. Now, being crucified, the place where he was crucified was not very far from the temple itself. And I have wondered about that. I've wondered, when he was crucified, was he able to actually look over and see the temple? that temple that he had, had visited so many times, that temple that he had gone into. And the thing is, I, I thought to myself, well, he went into the temple, but because he was not from the family of Aaron the Levite, because he was not a Levite, he could not go into the court of the, um, court of the priest. He wasn't a priest. He couldn't go into that court. He couldn't go into the sanctuary. He couldn't go into the holy place. He couldn't go into the most holy place. And I was thinking, man, here he is hanging on the cross. Did he see the temple? If he did, what was his thoughts? What was he thinking when he saw the temple? We know the story about the two thieves on each side and how one rejected and one asked for, uh, for him to remember him. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. That word remember is very important. When Noah and his family were in the ark, God remembered them and he delivered them. Samson had been blinded and he was at a feast. He placed himself between the post, the main pillars of the building. I'm leaving out a lot of information, but when you read the story, you'll understand. And Samson, being blinded, at the post, and he says, Lord, remember me just this once. God remembered him, gave him the strength he needed to push those pillars. The whole house came falling down. When God remembers someone, the children of Israel were in bondage, and God says, and God remembered them. He remembered them. He heard their cries. He remembered them. He delivered them. So when someone is remembered, it's as if they will never perish. If you remember someone, I remember my mom, I remember my dad, I remember this person. There's something about them that continues to live on. And so the thief says, remember me. And Christ assured him that he would. But Christ is hanging on the cross. And as he's hanging there, he begins to feel himself about to die. And this is where we want to go back and talk about that curtain a little bit. All right. 
Christ is hanging on the cross. And let's think about the Father. Remember, the curtain in the temple is the hem of God's garment. And if you remember, when someone is going through difficult times or a struggle, remember Job, when Job lost his possessions, money, he lost his children. What did Job do? The Bible says that Job rent his clothes and he prayed. That outer garment, he rent his clothes and he prayed. Christ is hanging on the cross, suffering. The Father is watching. The Father has seen all of this. And at the very moment when Christ would die, the Father is in agony. And in agony, I can imagine the Father taking his outer garment and beginning to rip his outer garment, just like anyone who's having their son or someone they love persecuted and put to death like this here. And as he rips you from top to bottom, he gets to the hem. And remember that curtain in the temple? That curtain, that was the garment of God, the hem of God's garment. As God gets to the hem, what does he do? He rips it from top to bottom. That's what happened to the curtain in the temple. Remember, it was ripped from top to bottom. Now, I can't stand, stand here and tell you that that's a true story, that God actually has a garment that he ripped. That's not in the Bible. That's a part of my imagination. That's part of what I see when I remember that they believe that the curtain in the temple was the hem of God's gar garment. And so that's the way that I look at it. You may read it and see it in a different manner. And that's fine. I have no issue with that at all because I cannot prove what I just said. But I like to think that God was in such agony that he was the one that ripped that curtain from top to bottom, whether it was the hem of his garment or he just simply sent an angel perhaps to rip it. I don't know. But the thing is, the curtain was ripped and the way to salvation is open to all. There is no difference between uh, Jews and Gentiles, everyone comes to the feet of Christ in need of help. And when Christ died, we know, and I'm leaving out information once again, but read things for yourself. We know that Christ ascended to heaven, and not only did he ascend to heaven, but he became our priest and our high priest. He entered that temple in heaven. He entered the sanctuary in heaven. He couldn't do it down here on earth, but he entered the holy and the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary, and he's there now pleading for you and for me. Now, as I close out here, and this is something that I think, I'm hoping it will cause you to think a little bit and to uh, maybe read the Bible a little, bit, a little bit more. When Christ, <clears throat> okay, it says that he ascended to heaven. And uh, in a couple of different places, it says that they saw, people saw Christ sitting at the right hand of the Father. Now, the Father is sitting on the throne of glory. And Christ is sitting on the throne of grace. Okay. Think about that. Christ is sitting on the throne of grace. And we find in the book of Hebrews, there's an invitation that is given to everyone. And that invitation is, let us come boldly to the throne of grace where we may find mercy and help in time of need. Now, if there's a throne of grace, if there's a throne Shouldn't there be a king sitting on that throne? There should be a king there. So the throne of grace is where Christ is seated. Christ is seated on the throne of grace. And salvation is offered to all. The thing about that is, 
he will not always be seated on the throne of grace. Salvation will not always be offered because there comes a time when Jesus will no longer be seated on the throne of grace. Okay. He will no longer sit on the throne of grace, but there will come a time, and I'm going to read something from Daniel. All right. Daniel, the 11th chapter. And this is where I want you to do a little thinking. Christ is seated on the throne of grace, but the time will come when we, he will have to leave the throne of grace because his job there, his ministry there will be finished. And in Daniel, the 11th chapter, Daniel, the 12th chapter, Daniel 12, we have these words. After he has completed his ministry in the most holy place, it says, and at that time, Shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. All right. I'm going to change a few things here. <clears throat> Talking about Christ, his ministry, when his ministry is over, what happens? I'm going to change this a little bit. It says, and at that time shall Jesus, the great prince which intercedes for the children of God, stand up from the throne of grace, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people, God's people, shall be delivered, everyone that shall have their names retained in the book of life. So there comes a time when Christ will stand up from the throne of grace, and at that time, heaven will no longer plead for mankind's salvation. There are some hard realities that we need to know. And Along with that verse of Christ standing up, I have one more to share with you as I prepare to close. Now, Christ stands up from the throne of grace, but now, after a period of time, it is time for Christ to come back the second time. And this we find in Matthew, the 25th chapter, Matthew 25 and verses 31 through 34. Remember, Christ stood up from the throne of grace. And here it says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And there and before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. This I think we need to talk a little bit more about. I hear very little about Christ seated on the throne of grace, but the time will come when he will stand up from that throne. And after a certain period of time, he will sit on the throne of his glory, that throne of glory that he shares with his father, and he will come in the clouds of heaven. He will come with power and great glory. Friends, Brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but I want to be ready when he comes in the clouds of glory. I want to be ready. And all of heaven, all the resources and power of heaven is at our disposal. It, God, God has given us everything that we need 
to be saved. He's given us everything that we need to enter into that kingdom. There's nothing that stands between us and the kingdom except for our own decisions, the decisions that we make. If we decide not to, we don't make it in. If we decide to, God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the angels of heaven, all of the resources that are needed are available to us. So as I close, I just hope and pray that each and every one of us will make our calling and election sure so that when Christ comes, we are ready. And I would just like to say that when I looked at the temple on earth and compared it to the temple in heaven, I'm thinking there's no comparison. The temple on earth might have been beautiful, but the Bible tells us that eyes have not seen. You know, we don't know what the temple looks like in heaven, but it's going to be a beautiful, beautiful place. We all need to make sure that we're ready to go when Christ comes. So brothers and sisters, let us make those preparations. Mm -hmm.